so glad uh, you've joined us in worship in this room online. And uh, I just want to say to start things off, just you're so, so lucky. You're so lucky that it's taken this long for me to talk and preach about running, one of my favorite hobbies that I can go on and on and on about till your eyes glaze over. I'm not going to do that today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how I got to run the Boston Marathon this past April 18th, 2020. Hey, thank you. Aw, you're so kind. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about how difficult the course is. It's one of the hardest courses. Bronze medalist Molly Seidel didn't even finish it. I mean, she was running twice as fast as I was, but that's different. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, the cool unicorn medal you get at the end of the race that I have hanging on my wall at the house. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all that. I'm kind of joking a little bit. I would love to talk about all those things. But I want to focus on my favorite thing to share about running when I do get to talk about it. I love what I've learned. I've learned so much about God, about life, about people through this hobby of running. I think that we can pick up so many things from any kind of hobby that we get to experience and enjoy. If you really have eyes to see and ears to hear, God can really teach us a lot of cool things through those things. And so I want to share with you a passage. You know, the Bible has a lot of real-life analogies that God put in there to really speak to us. And uh, for anybody that enjoys sports, uh, athletics kind of makes its way into Scripture to teach us some things. And running is one of the favorite analogies that God uses in Scripture. I'm only going to read one of several passages that refer to running. And it's in Hebrews 12. I want to read to you the first three verses. Here's what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary, or faint-hearted. Love this passage. And what I want to share with you in our time together this morning are what I would call the three surprisingly simple keys to victorious living. Uh, You know, running a race, at the end of the day, it's a race, and you want to finish it. You want to cross that finish line. Some of my even more competitive friends, and I would argue I'm kind of competitive myself, it does feel good to pass people and to finish as high up on the rankings as you can. So yes, we run to win. And and I would argue that the Bible teaches us to treat our lives that way, to run the race as if to win the prize. There's a passage in Philippians that says that very thing. That's what, what we're supposed to do. And I would argue that's what we are doing. Most every one of us in this room and watching, listening online, at the end of the day, do you want to experience a victorious life? Yeah. That's what what we're striving for. And, you know, when when someone were to ask you, well, what does that look like? What, What are you doing to experience victory in this life. If we're being honest, we will go to the, the natural things we go to, right? Like, well, I just want to provide for my family. You know, I just want to make a living and have a good income, and I just, I just want to provide shelter and comfort, and I want to go experience some cool things in this life. I'm not saying that in a, in a judgmental, condemning way at all. I think that's very natural. I mean, we would have to be lying to say that's not what we think about. You know, I'd love to be able to put on my holy hat and say, I never think of those things. I always think about suffering for Jesus. That's what I want my life to be about. (laughs) I don't. That's not what I think about. I did some weeding yesterday, and I was like, this is the worst. Adam and Eve, I'm so mad at you right now because this is the curse of the earth to pull these weeds out of my yard. It was terrible. Uh, I want to, victorious living would be never having to do that ever again. (laughs) That would be nice. 
That's called heaven, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, I want to look at three things in this little passage that give us keys to victorious living that I don't think we often think about. We, it'd be very natural to go to things like uh, talent or strength or uh, unexpected fortune, I, that this is what you're thinking is the, victory, the way to victory. But these three things I think we overlook and we underestimate, and they're right here in those three verses. They are focus, endurance, and understanding. Focus, endurance, and understanding. I want to just talk a little bit about each one in our time together. Today. First, focus. And, and I want to share with you a chain reaction that I think happens in our lives sometimes without us even, maybe I wouldn't say sometimes, most of the time we don't even notice it. We don't know that it's happening, but this is the chain reaction that happens in our lives. What you focus on affects what you think about. What you think about affects how you feel. How you feel affects what you do, and what you do affects your destination. So if you follow the chain, it starts with what you focus on. What you focus on determines your destination. And I remember as a teenager learning how to drive, one of the things my parents had to point out to me is, Bill, wherever you look, you tend to drive that direction. So why don't you look straight ahead, buddy? Keep your eyes on the road. It's like, oh, that's really cool. Mm, start veering that way. We do that with our lives. Where we focus on, we veer towards. And that's why in this passage, God gives us this amazing thing to remember. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, the author and the finisher of our faith, the starting line and the finish line of our faith. Jesus is everything. He's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And I know that sounds like a cool thing to say, but I encourage you, start living it that way. I'm saying it to me, Bill, Clark, start living it that way. Don't just love him in the moments where you're supposed to be loving him. Don't worship him in the worshipful moments where worship is supposed to be happening. Don't make him uh, the most important part of your life. What if we make him our life? Not just the biggest slice of the pie chart of our life. That changes everything. Speaking of focus, the thing I think about is on, on this amazing device I still live in awe that we all have these. And I remember when you wanted to take good pictures, this wasn't going to cut it. You kinda, I used to carry around a, a case around my neck if I went anywhere where I wanted pictures, and I had to actually have this thing called a camera and not a phone. It was just a camera. You took pictures, and you, you could only take the best really good pictures with an actual camera. Well, now... Man, forget a camera. This, the, thing, the way they've developed the cameras inside these phones, they're amazing. And I love the feature where I can take a selfie, and I'm really focused, but everything around me, behind me is really blurred. I think that looks cool. Because, you know, I want the focus to be on my face when I take a selfie most of the time. Unless there's something behind me I want people to see. I love that feature. It's so cool. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. But as I think about this passage and what it's teaching, I think that's what we need to think about. What does it mean to focus on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith? He is the strongest, highest resolution relationship person, thing in our life. Everything else is a little blurrier, but he is the main focus. Everything else around is a little dim. He has the spotlight. And I just don't think, you know what I'm saying? If we're being honest, we don't live that way very often. We really don't. When terrible, terrible things happen, then we run to the Father. And that's okay. He wants that. He desires that. But what if we ran to him every morning, the moment we wake up, no matter what our circumstances are, what if we keep our eyes fixed completely on him? When Jesus and others are your focus, you win. And I add others to that because, listen, if you focus on Jesus, he's not just sitting there, standing there in your life saying, I'm God and I love you. Isn't that cool? That's not where it is. He goes, all right, cool. 
you're watching me, you're focused on me, now I'm going to lead you into the kind of race this is all about. And you know what kind of race this is? It's the same race he ran. It was a race of laying down your lives for others. You're, there's no way you can focus on Christ without focusing on others. It's just impossible. You can't live a life if it's me and God against the world. No, it's you and God for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. It's still the same race. And we run it with our eyes fixed on him and the others he's chasing after. The others he wants to serve and he wants to win onto his team. That's the first key, focus. Second key, endurance. I want to park just a little bit longer on this one because I think this is so important. I think we forget that this is actually the big thing when it comes to finishing a race. You can be strong, you can be talented, but endurance is the persistent decision to keep going. It's one of the best definitions you'll ever know about endurance. It's the per persistent decision to keep going. You don't make it one time. You make that decision again, sometimes seconds later, sometimes a day later, but you keep going no matter what. And I would add to that, especially when you're in pain, but you decide to keep going. Now, I'm going to geek out a little bit. I love the Boston Marathon. You probably know and remember that there was a tragic thing that happened in 2013. Two brothers committed an act of terrorism with two homemade bombs that they detonated near the finish line in Boston, injuring over 260 people and killing three people. It's a big deal. If there's any city in America that's going to decide to keep going, it's Boston. Boston strong. That's, that was their mantra from that day forward. Boston strong. We are Boston strong. We're going to come back. We're going to keep running that race no matter what. And sure enough, a year later, they did the race again, certainly with more security and a whole lot of pomp and circumstance to honor those who were injured and, and remember those who were killed. What was cool is that my favorite marathon runner, Meb Kofleski, was the first American male in 31 years to win the Boston that year. So appropriate that an American runner on the first marath Boston Marathon after that tragic event won it. Everybody was so happy for him. Such a cool thing. But the reason I bring that up is because of what just happened at this most recent Boston just, this, just last month. A young man by the name of Henry Richard crossed the finish line. He crossed the finish line, and that's Meb, who won it in 2014. He's hugging Henry. He put that unicorn medal around his neck and could not keep the emotions inside of him. Why? Because Henry had made a decision that he was going to run the Boston Marathon one day in memory of his little eight-year-old brother, who was one of the three killed near the finish line. You won't see Henry's name listed in the top 100 finishers, the top 1,000 finishers. You know, it's kind of funny, and I don't mean to be funny in a moment like this. It's powerful. But one of the questions I get asked is, so what place did you finish in the Boston Marathon? And I know we're like in passing. I can't sit and explain. You don't understand that that doesn't matter. But if you have to know, it was like 7,138th. It was like, Yay. <laughs> and then I want to immediately go, but you got to understand there was like 30,000 runners. That's really good, man. You know, it doesn't really matter. That was a victorious moment above all moments. Henry crossing that finish line. While I was running, I passed by a couple of ladies, and one of them looked really, really familiar. And I found out after the race, oh, it was who I thought it was. The lady on the left here, her name is Shalane Flanagan, a well-decorated professional marathoner, Olympic medalist. And she was running with this lady to the right here is Adrienne Hazlitt. And I passed right by them. It's a good thing that I did not know for sure because I would have stopped and asked for selfies and 
been really creepy probably. I would have gotten, been so starstruck because she's an amazing runner. Uh, but Adrienne Haslett uh, ran with a prosthetic leg and finished the marathon. She, too, was a victim of those bombings. Professional ballroom dancer lost her foot, lost her lower leg. But she vowed that one day she would run that Boston Marathon, was supposed to run it in 2020, but a little thing happened all over the world that prevented that from happening. So she ran it last month. And here's a picture of her training with that prosthetic limb. When I look at these stories, I say, hmm, endurance. It is the persistent decision to keep going. I want to give you one more example. And these, actually a couple more. One example I want to give you is these, these are really dramatic examples, but sometimes it's not that. And you know, most of the time, not everybody in this room or you watching, listening online, it's not like you're facing these dramatic barriers. Sometimes it's just, man, I'm having a bad day. It's just that. Or you know what? The weather is terrible. It's just that. And, and so another example of keeping going no matter what is another momentous occasion happened in 2018. For the first time in many years, a, an American female runner won the Boston Marathon 2018, and it was some of the worst conditions ever. It sleeted, freezing rain. People probably went to the Boston Marathon like, she's wearing shorts. Like, that was the plan. That's what usually you wear. And people were throwing on garbage bags and ponchos and trying to stay warm, and uh, she ended up enduring and winning. And this is one of the most epic finish line photos of Des Linden. Sometimes it's just... You know what? I don't have this dramatic thing. I just don't feel like going. But we still go anyway. Now, to go back to a more dramatic one, sometimes it's not just a moment that's huge and big and dramatic and tragic. Sometimes it's not something little like weather being kind of stinky. For some people, endurance is a lifelong thing. And it feels like, you know what? Every day is kind of a big deal to figure out how to do life in this world. And that brings us to father and son, Dick and Rick Hoyt. His son, Rick, had cerebral palsy. He pushed him in a wheelchair and crossed 32 Boston Marathon finish lines and 40 other marathon finish lines and six Ironman triathlon finish lines. The decision, the persistent decision to keep going. Blowout victories in this life are achieved by not letting pain stop us. That's it. It's not like, hey, look, you were amazing. You performed well. Blowout victories are when you say, I'm hurting, but I didn't let it stop me. That could be physical. That could be emotional. It could be whatever. I'm still going to keep living. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other no matter what and keep my eyes fixed on the one who made me and keep my eyes fixed on the one who is my finish line, Jesus Christ. I've seen this up front and personal. I've had so many people I love and care about battle cancer. My mama, my mother-in-law, my own father just recently and watching what they endured but the decision to keep going, keep going going and holding on to faith no matter what. That's victory. That is victory. Okay, I got one more. Focus, endurance, and lastly, understanding. This one is so subtle. It's understanding who you're not competing against. If I reread to you Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, you will not find competitors mentioned in that passage. And one of the cool things I've learned about running, even the most elite runners will tell you, man, yeah, we want to pass people. We want to finish high up on that list of rankings. Yeah, that's fine. We want to do that. But what's so cool about the running culture is that we are all in it together. And who you're really competing against is your own self. Who you're really competing against is your own innate desire to stop and to quit. Who you're really competing against is that inner voice that's telling you, you can't do it. How are you going to finish this race? That's your real competition. But everyone else around you, they're not your competition. 
They're your reason for running. They're your reason for running. You are not competing against others. You are competing for others and with others. And it's one of the beautiful things about the running hobby over and over again. One of the most encouraging groups of people you'll ever uh, run across are running groups. They cheer on everybody. I've heard uh, people ask me many times, like, okay, well, how was Boston? It's so hard to answer that quickly. But after running it for the first time last fall, the answer was very clear. My big takeaway from running it was I cannot believe how cheered for I was by people who had no clue about me whatsoever. It was an unworthy cheeringness. You don't know me. I could be a terrible person, but you're cheering me on. Saying, you can do it. Man, keep on going. You're great. Way to go. Got a free banana when you finish, man. Go for it. Black toenails are cool, man. Go for it. They just kept cheering from the starting line for 26.2 miles to the end. Constant cheering. One of the most famous parts of the Boston Marathon is what they call the Scream Tunnel. It's about the halfway point when you pass by a women's college, well, Leslie College. And boy, you can hear them a half a mile before you get there, screaming and cheering. It's awesome. The pace picks up. You're like kind of starting to slog a little bit, and you're like, all right, I could do this. Because of all that crowd support, all that cheering. The very first verse in Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, It's so easy to be like, I don't even know what that means. Okay, let's move on to where Jesus is the author and finisher of faith. I get that. It had just described in Hebrews 11 all these heroes of the faith that had gone on before us. Abraham, Noah, David, Rahab, all of them. And then it says, they're the ones that are the great cloud of witnesses. Another way of saying, they're the cheering crowd in the stands of the Colosseum. This is the picture that would have sprung up in the minds of those who read the letter that was passed around this book of Hebrews. Can you imagine being cheered for by Moses? Can you imagine being cheered for by the guy who struck down Goliath? We did it, and so can you. Keep going. Keep going. Finish the race. And that's the ones in heaven. I believe the ones who are not quite in heaven yet, also known as the body of Christ, also known as the church. I like to refer to it as God's family. We are crowd support. And you know what? Sometimes I do think we can find a way to isolate even though we're a part of the family of God. I don't know how we do that. That's probably a whole sermon series down the road, how we do that, but we do. And it's so unfortunate because we have the family of God all around us. We must cheer for one another. And let me tell you this. If you're sitting here saying, I I need cheerleaders, I just don't have them. I feel so alone, I don't have them. Here's the secret. Be the cheerleader, and soon enough, you will have cheerleaders. I've seen it over and over and over again. You just start cheering for others around you as best you can. Be that encourager. Be that crowd support in life, and watch and see. It'll come back to you. I promise you. Test me on that. So, The three surprisingly simple keys of victorious living are focus, endurance, and understanding. Focus your life on Jesus and others. Decide to keep going, even though you're experiencing pain. And then understand that others, they're not your competition, even the ones who are jerks sometimes. They're not your competition They are your key to victory. They're the ones you're running for and you're running with. So what do we do with this information? Well, here's a few next steps I ask you to prayerfully consider this morning. First, start focusing on Jesus and others. And again, for some of you, for this might be your first time thinking of that. Like, you've never done that. 
And it's time that you finally place your complete life into the hands of Jesus Christ. Like, I'm going to make my, I'm going to surrender my entire life to him. No longer focusing on me, my circumstances, what I want in my life. It's no longer my life. It is now his life. Man, that would be a huge step to take today that I invite you to do if you've never done that. But I have something else to tell you. If you choose to do that today, and those of you who have done that before are going to get this when I say this, you will have to wake up tomorrow and totally do that again. (laughs) You have to wake up the next day and totally do that again. Repentance is not a one-time thing. Surrender is not a one-time thing. Worship is not a one-time thing. Following Jesus is a daily decision to wake up and do it again and again and again. And the second step, don't let the pain stop you. Keep going. It makes me cringe a little bit when I hear that one of the reasons someone has pulled away from God is because of life's pain. Because unfortunately, the enemy has somehow spoken to them a lie. You won't find here in Scripture that following Jesus is a pain-free life. Heaven is a pain-free existence, but we're not there yet. Until then, friends, being in this world means experiencing pain. The good stuff that happens is when you actually can talk about that time when Jesus carried you. And kept you going. And those awesome moments when God sent the family of God around you to support you and encourage you and help you in your time of need. That's the story he's writing. And they're great stories. We shared marathon stories that were great. Man, in this very room and watching, listening online right now, there are so many other amazing stories being written about people who had pain but kept going. If you're here and you're experiencing pain in your life, hear the voice of God. Hear the voice of all those in heaven, the great cloud of witness saying, don't stop. Keep going. And then lastly, cheer for others. If you don't know anything else to do, just do that. Just do that. Even when you don't feel like it, just do that. And I'm here to tell you, it will change everything. It will change you. It will change your heart, change your perspective. And you'll be more connected than ever before with others. And I have a feeling that more than anything else, somebody who's watching and listening today needs others in their life. So what will your next step be? Let's talk to God about that right now as we pray. Will you bow with me? Our Father, we... We run to you right now asking you to show us what do you want us to do next, God? Perhaps someone for the very first time hands over their entire life to you, letting you be the focus, letting you be the starting line, the race, and the finish line of their lives. Oh, God, that's a different way of living. And we get off course so many times Help us to renew that decision right here, right now, to zoom in on you, oh God. Lord, maybe what someone needed to hear today is to not let the pain stop them, to put one foot in front of the other today and to do it it again in five minutes and to do it again a minute after that and to do it again and again and again. And by keeping their eyes on you, and by cheering others on as they do it. Oh, my lands, what a new way of living you're going to create. And Father, if if there's anyone here in this room or watching and listening online that is lonely and isolated, may they take up the challenge to become the best crowd support for the people around them that they could be, to start cheering and see what you do with that. Father, lead us into whatever next step you want us to take today. We pray in the name that is above all names, the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.